So for the record, my name is Clay Purvis. I'm the Director for Telecommunications and Connectivity with the Department of Public Service. Um, I think it's important to put in perspective what the poll attachment rules do, uh, how, what they're intended to uh, do, and um, how wireless technology fits into that. So poll attachment rules govern the relationship between poll owning utilities, such as GMP, um, consolidated other telephone companies who actually own the polls, and uh, other entities that want to be on those polls. So the problem that n all over the country we're faced with is access to polls. How can someone like PC Fiber or Comcast, who doesn't own the poll infrastructure, be allowed onto that poll? Mm -hmm. And right now, Vermont has rules that govern poll attachments. The PUC has 3.7, has rules. And we see entities using those rules today to attach to, to our polls. And we have, uh, if you look you know, anywhere in Montpelier, I drive home to Northfield, and you know, there's four attaching entities in the telecom space. And so our, the, the rules say, OK, how, how do you uh, assess the cost of being on the poll? Um, what are the timelines? What are the rights of the poll owning utilities as far as making sure the engineers are satisfied that the polls are structurally sound, um, and that you know who needs to move up and down and how that works? And the petition that we filed with the Public Utility Commission updates that. And one of the ideas in that petition is one touch make ready, and it's the idea that okay when we're going out and we're moving telecom attachments up and down to put more on, we should just have one person or one entity do that. So, so right now, each, each entity comes out and move, because the complaint we're getting is it can take a year yes. to get your, a permit to put your, your wire on the pole, and time is money. Correct. So in that, but part of that is because each and one of those individual entities has to come out and move their stuff up so that the new guy can go on. Correct. Or third party. Or, or third party. Or the owner of the polls. Right. I was get to that. But what poll attachment rules are not are the relationship between the government and the entities that want to be on that poll. So there's no, um, it's not a permitting process like, say, 248A, which governs the, uh, the placement of telecommunication, wireless telecommunications equipment in the state, or Act 250, which also governs that. And so um, th these rules are simply about making sure that the owners of the polls are treating fairly the, the entities that want to be on those polls. And right now, the problems that we're seeing are with you know, cable and fiber providers that want to be on those polls. Real concrete issues like if there needs to be a new poll set, as in a poll needs to be replaced with a, a, a better poll, um, are they going to do that on time? Right. And those are the problems that we're trying to solve. Um, the, the, where the problem is on the poll is not where <coughs> 5G antennas want to be. We're talking, you know, the, the middle of the pole. That's where the cables are. 5G wants to be on the top of the pole. And that is in the electric space. And so, and so if 5G were to advance at some point, it would have to go through a process such as the 248A process. If, yes, if, if 248A is triggered, and certainly modifications could be made to that if there were concerns um, about this issue. But, um, you know, if the poll rules are working the way they should be, yeah. then we don't get involved, right? Because everyone's following the rules, and the electric companies and the uh, poll owning telephone companies are treating fairly the, the attaching entities. Only right. when it takes a year that you start getting involved. Exactly. Um, today, wireless companies, you know, can use the poll attachment rules to be on it. I think that. You know, one issue with 5G or one question about it is 
Is it really coming to Vermont? And is it going to come here in a meaningful way? So that's certainly a good question tangential to yeah. the. Could you just say it clearly? If someone wanted to attach a 5G cell or a 4G cell that could be later upgraded, do they have to go through 240 whatever? AA. Uh, that depends on uh, certain factors. So, okay. so that's where you know the the rub is going to be. Um, uh, 248A was created in the time when we were doing macro facilities, large 120 foot towers. Um, small cells may or may not, it depends. I believe Act 250 is triggered at 50 feet. So if the cell is under 50 feet, mm. you don't have to go through Act 250. 248A is right now optional. Um, I do know there's language in the house could, could that. that would make 248A just apply to all telecom infrastructure, regardless of whether Act 250 is triggered. Um, and that's certainly an easy solution. Um, but it would depend on, I guess, the facts of the situation. Uh, the telecom space, which is you know, where we're seeing a lot of the issues, the pole replacement issue, is n not really of concern to the wireless carrier. They want to be at the top of the pole. They'd like to have a riser or something that even brings them above the pole. Um, VTEL has some facilities out right now uh, that are already on poles. So, you know, it's... Did they go through the permit? No, they did not. So, uh, I believe those are under 50 feet. Many, I would say though that many companies AT&T and Verizon are getting 248A permits I'm for their, I'm sorry. So many companies, uh, AT&T and Verizon, I'm aware of, do file 248A petitions for their uh, facilities. Yes. Yes, they do, or no, they don't. No, they don't. Okay. okay. What we want to do I'm hesitant to get into 248 and Act 250 because I remember that was a really difficult kind of process to go through and we were then looking at cell towers and trying to find a balance between the kind of local control and also the need of the state to have cell service and we right. still haven't gotten cell service of any kind, fairly large portions of the state, and we're still trying to get it out there. So I'm hesitant to mess in that. I also would be concerned that somebody could go up and put 4G that can be converted to 5G on a pole without there being any, you know, if, if there's a loophole in this, I, so I think what I'd like is to see if we can find a way that says, look, we're doing broadband, we're going to do the pole attach, we're going to do something with pole attachments, I don't know what yet, but you can't put up any 5G stuff until the legislature is active or before next July when we have a chance to act. The question is, is the state precluded from doing anything regarding 5G and particularly 5G for a health or potential health issue because of federal law? Does federal law preempt us from doing any of this? I thank you for that question because that was going to be the next thing I mentioned. Um, so federal law is pretty is uh, clear on this issue. Uh, Section 332 of the Telecommunications Act um, has several uh, preemption clauses in it. One is that the state may not uh, prohibit 
uh, the entrance of market actors into our state, so we can't. Yeah, we, so Verizon can't come. Right, and whether that applies to specific technology, Verizon, you can't bring your 5G, or nobody can bring 5G. The other is the uh, prohibition on states regulating wireless uh, facilities based on the environmental um, or the perceived environmental impacts of the technology, i.e. health effects. The FCC regulates um, uh, yeah, EMF ra radiation um, at, uh, at a particular level. If the companies meet that level, then it's legal the states can't make a threshold that's lower than what the federal standard is. The FCC says 5G can come. Correct. We no essentially can't in, in addition to that, the, the FCC issued an order last fall called the Small Cell Deployment Order. So several, uh, so, well actually it's a very small order compared to FC, other FCC orders. I think it's only 100 pages. Uh, and this order uh, provides states and municipalities with guidelines about what kind of small cell permitting process they can enact. Um, some of the factors, I don't have them all memorized, but it has to be objective, it has to be written down um, ahead of an application being processed. Um, it has to be reasonable. Um, I think the devil's in the details there, but um, they've given us factors that we can do. And many states now have small cell permit procedures. Okay, so we should, yeah. but for today, could we amend the bill and say, that no small cell over 2G, because I know we've got some 2Gs, we'd like towns to have some cell service, or no cell over 3G? There is. Okay, no cell over 3G can go up until, the, or four, perhaps, until the state has developed a permit process. Is that within our research? Senator Brock is, yeah. I yeah. I would hesitate to say yes to that. I th I think that um, okay. it, it it could be an invitation for a challenge. Um, w with that said, there's no um, I don't think there's anything stopping the state from coming back and doing a permit process that as long as it's not preempted by. Um, uh, federal guidelines. You can't put something up until we have a permit in place? The FCC order that came out, um, I believe, put a timeline on states complying with that particular order, which was 180 days from uh, when it was published in the Federal really Register. Kind of this? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Isn't it true? that we have broad authority to regulate our poles and towers. You have siting authority over, so okay. things like so, aesthetics you can regulate. So we could say here that any tower, any pole installation other than wires would be subject to 248 process, for instance, without tripping the federal I don't believe that would uh, trigger the preemption language in the Telecom Act. I, I do want to caution this is getting kind of in the weeds of a legal analysis. Um, I'll just ask that, right. Jill, Jill some legal analysis for us. Um, I do believe there's, a, there's already language in the House that has something to that effect that okay. might be a good starting point. Can, can I just follow up? Sure. Are yeah. you on 5G or? Yeah, I, I am. Well, I, I'm just trying to understand what is the problem that we're trying to solve here right now. Well, we're, and maybe I'm, we're trying to do broadband. No, I understand. Not. But with the 5G, are we trying to send a message? We're in, trying we, to pacify the public who seems to think that we are participating in mm -hmm. some kind of a conspiracy to spread 5G towers through Vermont that will be bombing them with radiation waves. And we haven't 
I don't think that's what we're doing. Would it be possible, Madam Chair? I'm just wondering, could we even put intent language in there if that's what, again, if that's what the committee is with, it is not the intention or? I, I think we could put it in okay. the intent, but if there's some way we could give them a little more surety that okay. these cell towers are, you know, that, that these antennas or whatever they are are not getting affixed to the poles without some opportunity. It sounds like we don't have the opportunity to assess the health risks uh, or that we can't ban it. It, it. it reminded me of the kind of Vermont Yankee situation where oh, I'm so sorry <laughs> but someone stands up and says this is stuff is dangerous to our health and then someone else stands up and says you can't talk about that and then that question from my point of view people feel like section 19 has to do with 5G and yes. yet folks uh, in state government tell us no it says nothing to do with 5G so if there's an opportunity to make that clear and help people, you know, that, that would be the goal for me. I, if it were a conspiracy, I would say I'm an unwitting pawn. Okay. Um, I, I doubt it. What would he really say? What, what, what brought us to our poll attachment petition was the, these discrete issues that were brought to our attention by pole attaching entities. BC Fiber doesn't have a yes. single yeah. uh, wireless antenna. I would doubt that they would provide their, wire, their wired network to a wireless competitor. Um, that doesn't seem like good business sense to me, but um, th these issues that we're experiencing are taking <coughs> place in places like Chelsea, Vermont, where that doesn't have 2G yet, right? So. I've never gotten a cell signal in Chelsea. Neither have I. Yep. Even when I was looking at coverage code boxes, I still didn't. So, it's a beautiful town, but it's a But it's been suggested that we include penalty if there's foot dragging. So, so as we're trying to speed up installation, do you have thoughts on that? I do. Um, I hesitate uh, to encourage a penalty. We didn't uh, petition for a penalty when we amended or petitioned the PUC. Um, instead, we, uh, re we went in the direction of a self-help remedy. So if the companies aren't complying, you can hire a contractor at their expense and get the work done. Um, and even, even if it's a full replacement? Um, that was not fully vetted in our petition, but I would like to see even pole replacements. Maine does that. Maine has a self-help um, option, and it works well uh, from what I hear. Um, doing the one touch, our petition did not separate uh, uh, simple from complex uh, make ready. So if there is a pole replacement, under our petition, the attaching entity could replace the pole using the, the make the risk. Language, there is that self help. <clears throat> um, I believe the language is written, um, provides that the utility commission will implement one touch make ready policies. They did not. Um, Specify what uh, she would be able to speak to that, but um, you know penalties. You're assessing it on on the power company, and then the PUC has to figure out, okay, is this going to impact ratepayers? Um, kind of speaking out of turn. It's uh, not my specialty, but um, when you uh, a power company gets a request and it needs new poles. Mm -hmm. Is there any consideration done for the fact that it's January or February and the ground is frozen 15 inches down? The, the, the culture of um, weather plays into Make Ready and kind of the culture of the way the staff at these various companies work. 
um, they like to resolve these issues on their own. Um, and uh, the PUC has seen very little in the way of complaints brought to them officially about poll attachments. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that these, the people in each of these companies are working together every day. They don't want to ruin those relationships. And um, certainly, just because a company is violating a law, if they have a good reason that they can't get out and do that work. I've seen, you know, both GMP and EC Fiber, for instance, have worked together, I think, very well, um, having weekly conference calls to um, settle poll make ready disputes uh, or issues. And uh, certainly would like to see that kind of thing continue. But, you know, when you get down into that kind of level, it's something that really the, I think the PUC needs to work through. Uh, hearing from all of the parties in a kind of a workshop setting it uh, gets pretty cumbersome. Okay. All right. Do we have any, I'm going to try, can you stick around? Sure. I'm going to let Representative Purvis talk, but I have to hear any more. Right <laughs> 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 no, Sebelia. But so, are there any notes about people that need to leave in 10 minutes? Yes. Okay, but so I still don't feel like we have any clarity about what it is that we are able to do in terms well, of... Well, I've asked Maria research. to research yeah. that, and I'll have her... Wonderful. She's our legal counsel. We are not going to make any decisions. Thank you. Until we feel it's as clear as it possibly can okay. be. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Claire. All right. Representative Sebelia. <laughs> Welcome to Senate Finance, but we have to digest to you at all day to do, and we've got an hour. So wow. Help okay. us catch up. We're I can talk fast. In your thought process, why you did some of the things you did with poll attachments, why you didn't just do the FCC rules, why okay. you went, to, you know, just help us understand what. Yeah, what you would think. Do you want the big picture on the bill, or do you just want poll attachments? Um, I, think we and mostly, I think we mostly want section 19, 19 I think, poll okay. attachments. That's what I want. But there are yeah. other things that um, you might help us if you can with the 5G issue. Did they miss you and just catch us? Or? I, think they, I, I think the concerns around 5G did miss our committee. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and as, as you've heard, um, we can't regulate based on uh, health concerns with uh, regard to that. So I think we would not have probably taken any action on this. Right. Um, this is also the one touch make ready that we put in. Um, the, really the most compelling bit of testimony that we had with regard to this was um, a similar policy <coughs> enacted in Maine. Mm -hmm. And um, once enacted in Maine, really no problems in terms of delays. This was put in in order to resolve the delay issue. Uh, so it's, it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, we did not uh, go with the FCC. We did not consider the FCC policy um, in talking. Uh, I, I don't think it ever was something that came to our attention or that we were, um, we were asked to consider. Um, we, one of the biggest hindrances we have here with regard to, or have had here with regard to broadband build out is really a federal preemption. As most of you know, there's very little that we can do with regard to internet. There are two areas that we are not federally preempted. Clay may say there's additional ones. I don't know if he's still in the room. But uh, the CPGs and the poll attachments, we are not federally preempted. Um, and I certainly would not recommend that we let go of that little tiny bit um, that we have. Uh, there's nothing that prevents us or prevents the PUC from looking at the federal rules and incorporating all of the pieces that make sense. Um, in that. Uh, this, I think, allows us keeping the, the um, 
rules that we've put in here allows us maximum flexibility, really, in terms of being able to change what's not working or what is, you know, make improvements. So that's what I have to say about pole attachments, Madam Chair. Um, I'm looking. I have listened to some of your testimony. This is about our third um, and so if I might, um, just a few, are you interested in a few, I've heard a few questions come up from testimony that I could, whatever you want to, yeah. Okay. We're trying to, we're trying to just understand your yep. thinking and, you know, how, how you got to where you were. Yeah. So, I mean, we really see this as a rural electrification type bill without the massive amounts of federal dollars. Rural electrification was accomplished with um, electra, the creation of electric co-ops and massive federal funds. In Vermont, we have these communication union districts, and we think this is really how we'll end up solving this problem. Um, a couple of items that I have heard um, a couple, uh, some consternation on. With regard to the study on the electric utilities, uh, we worked with, uh, oh God, help me now, they're gone. What is the transmission utility? Velcro. Thank you. Uh, with Velco, um, prior to the session, during the session, in terms of what are the opportunities here to just think about this? Uh, talked with the distribution utilities. Um, in terms it's of the- using the Velco um, broadband line. It's, it's a question of having the DPS conduct a study about the feasibility of using the electric utilities infrastructure to build out fiber. And by infrastructure, we meant not necessarily just the electric space, which I believe from Clay has been used, although um, I think Leslie Nolte questioned that. Um, the infrastructure that uh, the utilities have that could be very, you know, they have the poles, they've got trucks, they have technical knowledge, they have billing infrastructure. Um, so that um, is another system, like our telecommunication system, that is transitioning, and there may be some synergies there so that's, that's why we included that language. And we know that some of the smaller utilities in particular are interested in maybe doing a pilot project around that. Um, I've, had, I've heard a number of questions around speed. I imagine you all are having a pretty healthy conversation around that. Uh, we picked 25.3 um, because it's the federal definition. Um, we were not willing to um, encourage municipalities to invest in aging copper networks, not at all, because you know we're imagining that municipalities are gonna be bonded potentially or borrowing significant sums. Um, 25.3 seemed to be the least, um, the least that we were willing to encourage municipalities, and that is cable. Um, there are potentially some 25.3 technologies on wireless. Um, we know that Every solution will. We we don't believe, we don't think. I shouldn't say we know. We do not think that every solution will be the same throughout the state. There may be varied solutions, varied partners that come together to do this. So, twenty five three does provide some flexibility. Um, so, so, I think uh, the dollars, the public dollars that we have in here, um, there's around a million dollars in grants, planning grants, which we think will be providing all of us some pretty critical information going forward. Um, there are, we hope that you'll include, as we did, the Vermont Universal Service Fund increase. Um, that will raise, you know, 1.2 million, maybe 1.3 million for, con for the connectivity -ish initiative on an annual basis. Um, if we just rely on that public investment, that's, you know, that's decades before we can actually cover. So we're encouraging municipalities to put it to pay off of their um, grant list. So, yes, so that's a long is, way we around. We use Vermonters dollars to yeah. subsidize 25 Right now, that's what the bill says, yes. It would allow for, it, it would. Some sections in here talk about 10-1 and 4-1. Um, 
those are minimums. So, where are we? Where are you going to land? 24 3. 25 3. Which I see, but I also see low numbers certified at least 10% of the potential customers. You have to get to page 19, Senator. We have testimony that because of these numbers, that some kind of block sparing was given as a, um, an example, would not be able to fit in because they didn't have the right mix. Some number didn't. Vita? Oh, yeah. This is the Vita. This is a long thing, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Page so, 19. Mm hmm. You're sure limited funding available. A. Looking at that, sorry. Thank you. Okay. So, with regard to the Vita loans, uh, and I believe that these speeds were intended. So, the, this is such a valuable, and I know you've heard testimony that this Vita <coughs> aspect is. An incredibly valuable, sure. yes. And so we have, I think we want to make sure that these funds go to the worst areas. So the areas that have the <coughs> most, the least amount of coverage, excuse me. And so that they are not, um, you know, used in places that may be able to find alternatives um, to cover. Okay, so. so, but that doesn't really answer the question. It, it seems like we're saying maybe truly we'll handle 24 three but if there has to be some 10 one or some four one we can support that too so tell me where we're not saying so this is a qualifier, I believe, for the loans. It's not saying that you can provide those speeds. I believe it's in order to qualify for this these is programs. That if your houses yes. Have one, ten one. Yes. That, that no, it's saying if you want to qualify for these loans, yes. that uh, in your area, one of, you know, part of the area that you're qual that you're applying, the right. area you're applying for has to have this kind of speeds or less. Now, already, yes. Already, that's what I mean. Yes. So it's not. Hmm. So. Um, it's not to invest in ten one. Right. It's saying. It's saying that this. It may be this next to nothing. Right. But I don't feel like it says that. Okay. Okay. We may need. I, I okay. think we got yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. It seems to be written. It feels like this. So in other words, you're saying, month. right? If the town has just says that ten percent of the people can only get four one today. Mm -hmm. Then you'd be eligible for one. That's what right. we're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's saying you don't, it's so not they have to at least have that. No. No. But we're not saying that's what you invest in. You're saying no. That's the lay of the land. That's qualifier. Or, all right. Well, what do you, you mean by qualifier? We're going to get it. I most underserved areas. Right. Oh, so that's the bare. Yeah. Position. I mean, if you if you have twenty five three, right. it, so if we're going to um, Bennington, you're not going to qualify for this loan. Mm -hmm. Probably okay, in the downtown what area, because you probably have more than ten. Doesn't, well, I suppose if they're in central Vermont, the, yeah. The, mm -hmm. So you would take. So they have nothing. Yeah. Right now in much. Roxbury, so they would probably qualify. All right, but they they aren't on themselves going to do this. They're going to yeah. be part of yes. central Vermont or EC. I'm not sure who's moving up there, and I guess the question would be, how do you? take that one town as a qualifier yeah. because Montpelier does have good service yeah. and they're also in that district and uh, so and I you, you're going to need 
some of the smaller, very underserved areas now probably don't have either the financial or the intellectual expertise to know how to put these things together. Right. And we, uh, you know, I don't know that it's super explicit in the bill, but we definitely <coughs> would prefer to see CUDs as opposed to single municipalities, particularly in the case of lots of um, small towns. And so in the case of a Roxbury, hopefully they are part of a CUD, right, that yeah. is considering. And I think you have taken and heard testimony from some of the startup um, ISPs that the $2 million cap here with Vita is low. They could certainly use more. We know that there are going to have to be packages, financial packages put together to get this done. And it'll be staged. So, you know, this may be, these dollars might be available in the Roxbury area, but not in the towns that are next to it. You know, you may have to do some bonding there or what have you. The great part about one of the helpful parts about the bill is the planning funds, which will help us kind of put those packages together yeah, so, so we understand really planning, they really are well. yeah yeah that's exactly right okay, okay. thank you Senator. and looking to see if there were any other pieces um, we would really encourage you to include the the human being the technical assistance um, that is in this. Uh, we know um, in these small towns they do not yeah. have the capacity to do this. And Carol Monroe, I think, is retiring. And so she's been, you know, the consultant for the state of Vermont, unpaid, I think, volunteer consultant for. Really? Wow. She, I mean, yeah, okay. folks have, she's been incredibly generous with her time. Jeremy Hansen now, yeah. Michael Birnbaum, those folks have been serving unofficially and very generously, but we really need some help for folks, yeah. which is not a knock at the department. No, I mean, we just yeah. need additional, yeah. 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 Exactly. Financial together. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. If we have a failure, that sets us back here. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that this is done correctly. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's it. <clears throat> Good. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks, man. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. 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 I move on to Michael Burke. Uh, if you please, if you don't mind, I'll start it. You can start. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Just make it on the agenda. I know. I'm sorry. Come on. Yeah. I just thought since we're talking about hanging things on the utilities poles, we ought to give them a chance to tell us how they feel about that. And thank you. We appreciate that opportunity. I'm Robert Dostas with Green Mountain Power. So there's a few points that I'll make about the sections of the bill that we've been kind of following and I would say working with the House on. Um, and then when we get to section 19 on the pole attachments, I'll make a couple of comments. And then I have Mike Burke here, who is kind of the, who, who sleeps with this stuff, thinks about this stuff all the time, and really is the expert on the issue. So any questions pertaining to the process for pole attachments, what we do around it, how quickly we respond, what some of the challenges we face are in getting them done in that, in that time frame, he's the person to be able to respond, because he has the field knowledge of that. So just overall, what we do, we did appreciate being part of the discussions in the House and kind of the, the changes of the bill as it went along. And um, in the end, we support where it all landed. Section, 13, section 11, page 13, that one talks about a study, right, to see what role utilities might play in the distribution, deployment of broadband and, and telecom services. And it's a good question to ask, and I know others have brought that up. Some said there's no role, others say there is a definite role. So I think having that conversation before the PUC is the right thing to do. Let's see if there is a role, what we can do, if anything, to promote um, the, the deployment. And um, in, in the bill, it, it says that the utilities will you know, work with the PUC, and of course, we'll be happy to do that, and look forward to what that actually, in the end, unveils. Because as we all know, we're all kind of, this is one of those, those issues that we're all 
rowing in the same direction that we all want it to happen. And, and I know we're limited in resources, so how can we work best together and use what resources we do have to achieve that? So we want to be part of the action um, to help accomplish that goal. Um, there's, uh, there's, there was talk about the FCC rules and uh, an amendment I think that was offered by Comcast um, and whether we should just follow that or not. Um, as I think you heard, there is a proceeding at the PUC that's been going on for some time. They are actually looking at that very issue. You know, what do you charge for one foot versus two foot? Do you, do you have one foot and two foot? Is it just one? Is it one and a half? And how do you do it in such a way that you're ensuring that you're not, that you're doing it fairly and equitably and you're not just having electric rate payers wind up paying for that service? So, so let, you know, our, our recommendation is let the PUC conduct that process and let's see where we land. Again, I think we're all on the same page wanting to get to the right outcome. Um, that process is poor, an important step in getting to that right outcome. And on, the, um, on section 19 of the poll attachment, uh, there again, you know, whatever we can do to streamline the process, um, we're good with. The language itself, we're generally good with. We did offer um, a suggestion in the House, um, and that was that the uh, entities that want to attach to our poll, if they would um, give us some heads up, give us some notice about that in advance, um, that will help us as we plan our own capital work. Um, what often happens is, you know, at a date certain, all of a sudden we get this work order for 4,000 polls. And, and, and we've gotten that, that kind of number. And then we're put in a position of having to figure out how to get that all deployed um, in, in the time frame that we're allowed. Um, so it can be a little challenging. So we did ask those yeah, So this isn't just one poll attachment. This is like 2,000. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. OK. And, and you, you know, would get it in order, like give us an example. Scale. So you'd get that from somebody in order to attach or do what exactly? To attach their, their, you go their lines. Their lines. Yeah, their lines. Way. Yeah. Okay. Their lines. So they need. Your mountain with yeah. A, yeah. Okay. And a lot of these are, are they're on, and, and Mike will correct me because I'm getting out of my element, but you know, off, a lot of these work orders are on, they're obviously on existing poles right. in areas that already have services, but this just provides customers with yet another option. Yeah. Um, but those those are big orders, and you know we asked if they could give us kind of more of you know give us some time to actually prepare, um, and the, the the response was that no they're concerned that by sharing with us too prematurely that information somehow or other their competitors would know, <laughs> and that uh, right. So okay. So my hope is that maybe through the PUC process we'll figure out a path forward to help us again. Thinking we're all rowing in the same mm -hmm. direction, let's help one another. That would be one way to help us help them. So hopefully, I'm just kind of putting that out there. But hopefully through the process we'll be able to address that. Is the price per poll the same as if there's ten or five hundred? I'm going to say yes, it is. And is the time frame the same? The price per poll, so they're, 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 the, um, the, what you pay to, to access the poll yeah. is a tariff same. and the same okay. for everybody. How about the timeline? The timeline meaning? Do you have the same amount of time to do one poll attachment as you do to do 4,000? Right, right. Yeah, yes. Mike, can I? There. Mike Burke, oh. Mike Green Mountain Power. He's shaking his head, yes. Yeah. Okay, well, so I there's different timelines based on the amount of polls that are turned in. Uh, and if you go over a certain level in one application, then the timeline extends. But I think it's all the way up to like 300 polls or something like that. I've got the numbers here. But it, you asked a lot of questions about how many. Can I just throw out some numbers real quick? Why don't you pull a chair and come on up? OK. Just pull yours up, or maybe somebody will move over there, and you can put the chairs, whatever works. Sorry. The only thing I will add while he's sitting is that there is language in this in the in the make ready language in section 19 that does acknowledge that there are extenuating circumstances that could delay our ability to actually um, get the work done, and there can be a, um, an opportunity to kind of forgive that and extend the timeline. That was important to us, mm -hmm. and in particular, when you're thinking about the challenges now we're facing with climate change. We imagine that those situations will only get worse, not better. So and that's based on the amount of polls, to your question. Okay. Uh, so in 2017, we had 293 uh, applications to get on our polls. That took in 
8,016 polls. In uh, 2018, we had 268 applications, 9,500 polls. This year, we've already licensed 71 attaches and already given license to 5,510 polls to get on. Uh, currently, we have 85 applications that are still open uh, for a number of polls, 4,196 that we're working through. Uh, so these are big numbers. These aren't go to an individual home. Uh, and some of the things we take into consideration when we're doing this, we do work really well. We have weekly meetings. Uh, with and, the attaches. Mm -hmm. And we also do try to let them know if they're trying to get into an area and we have uh, a reliability rebuild that we're about to do, we'll say, hey, we're about to do this. If you can wait till we finish that, uh, then you know you can get on. We give automatic licenses on lines that we've already upgraded. We don't even do surveys. We just let them get on. So you know we are doing things to try to help the the broadband companies and the communication companies out there. Uh, but we also do have some other. In October of last year, we uh, had I think nine high wind events between October first and New Year's Eve. And it was pretty tough to do a lot of work for anything during that time frame. Uh, but your first responsibility is to get the electricity. Keep the lights on. Yeah. Yep. Uh, <coughs> in the summer of last year, we actually shut down a lot of our own internal work to make sure we hit these deadlines. We were pulling crews from all over the state into districts where we had heavy <coughs> applications, mainly. Uh, in the central part of the state, the Chelsea's you talk about, the Royalton, places like that. And we did manage to just about hit all those goals. Just to give you an idea how GMP is actually performing on this. So uh, the GM, the 3.7 rule is 120 to 180 days. Uh, we averaged 191 days. When GMP had control of the poll set, we averaged 155 days. So we did hit our goals. Uh, when there's a different set company, that average went out to 251 days. But GMP average for every poll we were on was just barely over the criteria. But when we had total control, it was under. Uh, excuse me? It's a better part of a construction season, right? I mean, that many polls? That many days. Uh, 190 days. Yeah. What is that? It, the question on that brings me to you asked about the seasons. We are doing construction just about year round now. Uh, we have machines that dig through frost, so that you know that doesn't mean that it does slow us down because obviously we're not allowed on state highways if it's snowing. Uh, the lineman can't glove 7,200 bolts uh, when it's wet out and raining. Uh, you haven't gotten to do much this spring. Uh, we're out there every minute we can uh, to try to not only take care of these things, but also improve service in places that we know uh, haven't have had trouble in these major storms. So. And that just it's slightly off the topic, but mm -hmm. I have a question about the uh, complaints about towns who lose their E911 capacity because the electricity goes down and I think it's the new cable-based phone service needs electricity. And apparently the phone companies only have to report the outage if it's their equipment that's down. And so their <coughs> Shrewsbury has been very vocal with us, was without service for three days. The electricity mm -hmm. doesn't seem to have bothered them as much as the inability to have called out. And just wondering, right now we don't have a solution, but if you could let the E911 board, I know I frequently get emails and, and stuff from you and just put them on your call list so they're aware mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. some areas might be having trouble reaching that. Right. 
let you say that uh, that works for you, for the record. Yeah, um, when we have, and, and I think legislators know this, when you get an email from me about a storm, it's only their cause, it's really severe, and we expect it to last a couple more days, and people are going to be without power for some time. Um, when you've gotten that, we've already done a lot of communications already using the media, social media, every which way, um, and we only ramp it up as the, the outages go longer and longer. So when you do get that email from me, and I do it to the legislators, but I do it to a much broader stakeholder group as well, including businesses, um, and we even now reach out to customers who we have identified on life support. Um, now they know kind of, and I, I think many plan for the possibility of outages, and they have hopefully a, a plan for what to do, but um, we're beginning now to put a, in place a process where we actually call them to let them know if they're in an area that we think outage is going to last longer. So we're all about um, communicating and then continually improving, because I think there's a lot of opportunities to improve our communication. And again, as, as things change, as the weather changes, the climate changes, this is only going to become more and more important. And I think the more that we have these conversations, the better, because it is about resiliency planning in the face yeah. of a kind of a new world. So as outages are longer, and as people rely on 911 but don't have it because of power out, and we have new technologies that don't allow for that, we got to figure out other ways in which people in emergency situations can reach out, or processes in place where local communities are knowing who or where the problems are and doing whatever they can to help address it. Um, so it, it's it's a planning that it's a new level of planning I think that needs to happen, um, a more heightened level of planning that needs to happen around this, and you know, and we'll take whatever suggestions we can in terms of doing our outreach to alert people about the power outage that exists and, and when we think we'll be able to get power back on, which is a whole nother issue, and I'll, but I won't go into it. Yeah. No. All right. Thank you. Uh, you know, I hit on some of the things that we faced when we were trying to do this. Uh, I really wanted to make myself available too, just for questions. If anyone had any questions on, yep. okay. you know, I, I will say the one touch right now in the bill it says for communications, mm -hmm. and I do want to just state why it's a little bit different for electric. Uh, our linemen are actually gloved when we have to transfer. Everyone understands they're holding the 7,200 volts in their hand. And for us to get proper clearances on the breakers and people have to be rated to be able to do that, it's a little bit harder to do that with the electric than it is right. with the cable. So. No, I think that everyone understands. Mm -hmm. I doubt most of them want their people out there playing with your lock wire. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we don't want that. Be a little risky. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much.